Professor Carafit here, coming to you from the Bio Bunker. I hope everything is going okay. I know it's hard to stay motivated in online coursework, but stick to it. Stick to a schedule. Set a schedule and roll. Uh, don't let the semester roll over you. Community Ecology, Part 1. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about defenses against predation and herbivory. Uh, we're going to talk about competitive exclusion principle and a little bit about symbiosis. Okay, so let's start with competitive exclusion and this idea of what a community is. Remember, a community uh, is, is an interaction of several populations, so different species interacting in an environment and the abiotic factors in that environment as well, so climate and things like that. So specific biotic and abiotic uh, resources an organism uses in an environment is what a niche is. So I don't know if we've used the word niche a lot. So let's let's mention niche. Ecological niche is, is um, think of it almost like the job of an organism in the habitat. So what does it do? Is it the top predator? Is it an herbivore? So what, what does it eat? What does it do? So the definition here, the specific resources it uses in a habitat, kind of like saying its job, okay? That's a niche. Now, one thing that uh, uh, ecologists have determined is that there's this thing known as competitive exclusion. Two species with the same niche will not coexist uh, permanently in the same community. One will compete with the other until one wins, okay? So if they have the same niche, they, they compete with each other until one wins. However, there are ways they can both exist in the same community. Um, the first thing they can do, uh, the first thing they can do is, is resource partitioning. Uh, meaning, maybe uh, these two lizards both live in a tree and they compete for resources, habitat in that tree. One might move down to living on the trunk of the tree while this species now lives in the top of the tree. So they partition the resources. They use different resources now. They change their habits a little bit and then they can both coexist in the same environment. The other thing that happens is character displacement. This is more evolution. Um, this is when uh, characters diverge in sympatric populations more than in allopatric populations. What does that mean? Well, sympatric, remember, means in the same place. So you have two critters in the same place competing for resources. Then they may diverge quite a bit. And I actually have, I, I, I'm recording this kind of out of order. I have a figure for this in the next video. Uh, I didn't stick it into this PowerPoint, so it'll be in the next video. But let's say you have two birds on the same island competing for the same kind of food, well, eventually one one might uh, start eating different foods and develop slightly different traits, like a bigger bill and it's eating bigger seeds, while the other one has a slightly smaller bill and it starts eating different seeds. So they they uh, diverge a little bit, they, they change, they evolve, the populations adapt to slightly different uh, resources and that affects also the, uh, the anatomy of the bird. That's character divergence. Um, Meanwhile, if these were allopatric species, meaning one lived on this island and one lived on another island, they wouldn't show that divergence. So another thing to keep in mind then, this is kind of specialized terminology, an organism's realized niche might be different than its fundamental niche. Oh, what the heck does that mean? A realized niche is the, is the niche that the organism is actually doing in that habitat. A fundamental niche is the niche that, uh, that is occupied by an organism if there is no competition. So when there, is, when there is competition, the fundamental niche may not be possible. So that organism might experience resource partitioning. It might evolve slightly different traits and undergo character displacement. And it might uh, have a different um, uh, a realized niche than its fundamental. Now, when organisms are interacting in a habitat, and I'm not talking about those with the same niche, just organisms in general, interactions can take a number of forms. Plus plus interactions are when organisms both benefit from the interaction. Plus zero is when one organism benefits but the other is unaffected. And plus minus is when one benefits and one is injured. See if you can think of examples of these kinds of relationships before I move on. One word I want to define here real quick is this term symbiosis because we often kind of misuse it. Symbiosis does not mean a plus plus relationship. Symbiosis could be a plus plus, a plus zero, or a plus minus relationship. 
Symbiosis literally means two organisms living closely together. And that could mean they both benefit. It could mean one benefits and one does not. Uh, it's not always beneficial. Here's an example of symbiosis that is beneficial. It's called mutualism. It's a plus plus. This is when both organisms benefit. They, they come together. They both benefit. Okay. So bees pollinating flowers might be thought of this way. Uh, the, the flower gets uh, pollinated uh, and then gets its sperm carried off uh, and the bee gets something to eat. Fungi and green algae living together in a lichen. That is mutualism. Here we have ants living on an acacia tree. The ants defend the tree and in return they get food and shelter inside of those hollow thorns. They both benefit. This is a type of symbiosis. Commensalism. This is a relationship between organisms that's actually kind of hard to document with absolute clarity because maybe one benefits and maybe one is actually hurt, but maybe it's not hurt. Like, is this cow hurt by that egret standing on its back? Probably not. Maybe occasionally when it, like, gets scratched by a toenail. I don't know. But this is when one organism benefits. So this egret gets to stand up higher up in the air, you know, gets to see predators coming and things like that. The cow is unaffected. That's commensalism. Um, herbivory is a plus minus type relationship. This is when an organism consumes plants or algae. Um, and of course, plants have evolved in response to this and algae has evolved in response to, to this. We call this kind of like a evolutionary arms race. Uh, plant devo uh, evolves defenses, herbivores de uh, evolve a way to get around those defenses. This kind of arms race is probably what started uh, the uh, Cambrian explosion. Uh, predators evolve teeth, prey evolve shells, predators evolve bigger teeth, prey evolve ways to swim away from predators, and you have this massive divergence of life. Uh, this is called coevolution, when one organism affects the evolution of another organism co-evolution. If you didn't write it down yet, now you can. Okay, now, um, what are some ways that plants have adapted to herbivory? What's that? Say that louder. Uh, this is really hard communicating uh, asynchronously. Uh, when I'm back in time and you're in the future, you're not coming through. Okay, so how have plants adapted? Well, uh, plants um, have developed a number of adaptations. Thorns are one. Thorns, spines, things like that. Chemical defenses are other things they've done. How have herbivores adapted? Well, they have big flat teeth to chew up that, that, that plant material. They have symbiotic relationships with protists and bacteria to help them digest plant material. Plants have evolved secondary compounds. That's one of the major things they have done to uh, fight herbivory. Secondary compounds are different than primary compounds. Primary compounds are things like ATP and glucose, uh, uh, things that are made by a plant necessary for it to live, for its basic metabolism. Secondary compounds are not necessary for basic life. Instead, what they are for are, are often defense or attraction of pollinators and things like that. This is poison ivy. Poison ivy, uh, the poison on there is a secondary compound. Plants make lots of these things. Uh, let me name a few. Nicotine. That's a pesticide that kills insects that tries to eat tobacco. Caffeine. Cocaine is made from co coca leaves. Um, morphine. Uh, there are many, many others. Um, uh, uh, ephedra, which is used to make uh, uh, ephedrine, or, or the fake version Sudafed, I'm sure you've heard of. So plants make all kinds of these different uh, different uh, uh, chemical compounds. These alkaloids, they often end in I-N-E, and there are others as well that are not in that category, um, like cocaine, nicotine, ephedrine, uh, those things. Um, but, but plants make an abundance of these things. Plants also have physical protection. What do I mean by physical protection? Thorns, spines, things that ward off critters. This is a honey locust tree found here in Arkansas and other places. It has these giant thorns on its bark. Probably these evolved in the Ice Age to protect it from things like giant sloths from eating the uh, bean pods that grow on its branches. Predation. 
And this is when one animal consumes and eats an or catches, kills, consumes another. Um, predator adaptations. Teeth, claws, venom, camouflage. I want to talk about this real quick. Venom. Venom versus poison. We saw poison ivy and we've heard of venomous snakes. There's no such thing as a poisonous snake. Okay. What is venom? What is what is poison? Uh, poison is something you have you you rub on your skin or you have to eat to get sick from. Venom is injected into an animal. So venomous snakes inject venom, uh, a toxin, you know, into the to the uh, prey animal. So prey adaptations. How have prey reacted? to uh, these adaptations by predators. They have cryptic coloration, they have chemical defenses where they taste bad. Um, they, they, uh, uh, you can see some examples here of some cryptic coloration. Uh, chemical defenses, so think of like a monarch butterfly. It eats uh, milkweed and it tastes horrible to predators. Um, these are adaptations taken on by prey. Prey can also develop defenses like antlers or horns, although those are often used for males to compete with each other uh, for a mate as well. Now, because of prey developing these, these things, sometimes, you know, if you're poisonous, let's say you're a poison frog, it still sucks if something has to eat you to find out you're poisonous. So you might show off that you're poisonous. And to do that is known as aposomatic coloration. That's when uh, a predator... Uh, uh, sees this bright orange frog and says, nope, not going to eat that. So that's a warning to predators that you have some kind of sem chemical defense. That's aposematic coloration. Now let's compare that to a cool example of convergence, Batesian mimicry. Batesian mimicry is when a prey animal adopts the color patterns uh, of another animal that might be poisonous or venomous. So here we see an eastern coral snake. It's found in Arkansas, especially near Texas, and a scarlet king snake. Now, coral snakes, very, very venomous. King snakes, not at all venomous, but they have evolved a similar color pattern to the coral snake. And therefore, most predators see that and they leave them alone because they're not sure which one that is, so they don't eat it. That's Batesian mimicry. Here's another great example. Uh, on the left, we have a hawk moth, and on the bottom right, we have a parrot snake. The snake's head right there, you can see it. On the left, that remember, that's a hawk moth larva. That is the butt of a caterpillar, and it looks like the head of a snake. Isn't that cool? That's Batesian mimicry. Another plus-minus relationship is parasitism. This is a form of symbiosis as well, two organisms really living closely together. A parasite feeds on a living host, and these can take two forms, endoparasites, like this tapeworm here. Remember, that's a member of the platyhelminthes. It's a flat, highly surface area-rich organism that lives in the gut of uh, organisms and absorbs their nutrients. Uh, that's an endoparasite. While parasites that are on the outside of you, like this tick, which has transferred Lyme disease to this person, you can see that bullseye pattern. That's an ectoparasite, ecto, living on the outside. All right, so when we pick up next time, I'm going to show you a few more examples of um, a community ecology, things that community ecologists might look at, and uh, then we're going to move on from there.